talking about vital signs, oh yeah. Hi there, welcome to my YouTube channel, welcome to my nursing channel. My name is Nurse Master Charlie, and today's topic is going to be on that of vital signs. I started this year kind of wanting to do more nursing school related type of videos and I started off this year's videos kind of with more of the history of nursing which is actually called the history of nursing part one and then I had a second part which was the history of nursing part two which was about Florence Nightingale. She's the lady with the lamp color Florence Nightingale. And nursing. she was a fascinating person. Nursing has a fascinating history. And if you have a chance, I'll put a link in the description somewhere so you can go back and check out those videos. If you want to learn more about nursing and nursing related topics, be sure to subscribe, like this channel, and also click on the notification bell so you can be aware of when I post new videos. And I'm also starting something new relative to the nursing school type of videos that I'm going to be making. At the end of the video, I'm going to be putting NCLEX type related questions that are pertaining kind of to the topic of whatever I'm talking about. Now the question I'm going to pose will be answered in the subsequent video. Now this video, for example, is on vital signs and it's going to be the beginning of a two or three part series. This is going to be just describing what vital signs are and in the next couple of videos I will be discussing and actually showing the clinical skill of how to do a blood pressure, for example. Not that you don't know, but what are vital signs? Vital signs are a group of physiologic measurements about life-sustaining or vital functions what? of the body. Now the normal ranges for vital signs are going to vary depending on a person's age, their height, their weight, and their overall health status. But the data is going to give us information about what's going on at their health at that particular time and also to show us positive and negative changes of things like medications or exercise or different things that they're doing to change their vital signs. Now there are four primary vital signs. These are temperature, pulse, respirations, and blood pressure. And in some schools of thought there is the fifth vital sign which would be something like pain and then in the sixth vital sign, these can be things like blood glucose, level of consciousness, height, weight, and even menstrual cycle. In the comments below, tell me in your opinion, which do you feel is the most important vital sign and why? There is no wrong and there is no right answer. Maybe we can start up a little conversation or a little community in the comments about this topic. So now that we know what vital signs are, we need a way to obtain them we need to gather some equipment. So first we need to make sure a couple of, of a couple of things that the equipment is clean and it is calibrated and it is the right piece of equipment for the right vital sign. You don't want to try to do a pulse rate and go measure somebody's pulse by sticking your finger in their mouth trying to measure their temperature, for example. So first we're going to need to gather something like a thermometer. There are a variety of thermometers out there. There is oral thermometers, rectal thermometers, there are temporal thermometers, there are tympanic thermometers, there are now the new infrared or skin thermometers. So make sure that you're going to use the right thermometer for the right area. You don't want to try to use a tympanic thermometer and stick it in somebody's mouth. For example, we're going to need to gather a sphygmomanometer or a sphygmomanometer, which is the long technical word for a blood pressure cuff. Now the sphygmomanometer was first introduced in 1896 by a Italian physician by the name of Schiapone Riva Rocci. I'm not sure if I said his name right. Now the word sphygmomanometer is a word that was put together from the Greek sphygmos, which means the beating of a heart or a pulse, and manometer, which is a device for measuring pressure or tension. So sphygmomanometer measuring the heartbeat or the pulse or the pressure of the heart. We're going to need to gather a stethoscope so we can hear the pulse rate when we're taking a blood pressure using a sphygmomanometer. We're going to need a watch, either a digital watch or an analog watch, 
so that we can use it to time to count pulse rates and respiratory rates. And in some instances, we may need an oxygen saturation device or an SpO2 monitor. All of these devices, minus the stethoscope, are probably included in the mobile uh, portable blood pressure device, which uses is used to measure blood pressure. It has a um, SpO2 monitor, oxygen saturation monitor on it. And then of course through that you can also gather the blood pressure and it usually has a temperature, a thermometer on the side of it also. And the next vital sign we want to consider thinking about is maybe asking about pain. If you're asking about pain, you want to know what type of a pain and where is the pain at. Now once we've gathered all of our equipment, we want to make sure that we perform hand hygiene and then that we put on the proper PPE depending on the type of a patient and the environment that we're working in. In the hospital setting, you want to make sure that you use two patient identifiers. You can ask the patient their name, their date of birth. Hopefully they have a wristband on them. If you're not in a hospital setting, you can always ask the patient their name and their date of birth. And one very important thing, you want to make sure that you tell the patient who you are and what you are going to do. Don't assume when you go up to somebody and tell them, hey, I'm here to check your vital signs, they may not know what a vital sign actually is. So take a moment to explain to them, I'm gonna be taking your vital signs, tell them what that consists of. I'm gonna take your blood pressure, your temperature, your pulse, your, your respirations, let them know what you're going to do. This will help you to establish trust with the patient and then they get to know you. So when you tell the patient, I'm going to take your blood pressure, your pulse, your respirations, your oxygen saturation, you wanna let them know or ask them, is that okay? They can verbally say yes, which is gonna give you consent, or if they give you the nod okay, or if they give you their arm, that is giving you an implied consent, which is kind of nice because on a side note, kind of technically, if you reach for somebody's arm without their consent, that is a type of an assault. If you grab their arm to take their pulse, not that you're grabbing with force, but that can be technically considered battery so now you've just considered or you've just committed assault and battery on a patient so you just want to avoid any legal ramifications ask the patient or tell the patient what you're going to be doing ask them if it's okay and if they give you the arm or if they nod yes or if they don't acknowledge you maybe they didn't understand you are they speaking your language did they hear you you want to clarify all this prior to you doing their vital signs so after you perform the vital signs for this patient, you want to make sure that you clean the equipment if it is not disposable, or if it is made strictly for that patient, just leave it in that patient's room. And then make sure that you document what the vital signs that you just obtained, what they were, put them in the patient's chart. All right, so let's talk specifically about each vital sign. Now, temperature, like I said earlier, you can do a temperature orally, you can do it rectally, you can do it tympanically, temporally, and even infrared diddly, if that's a word. <laughs> but there's different ways that you can obtain a temperature. Um, theoretically, you could see if somebody's warm by touching their forehead, but you want to make sure that you use the back of your hand. This isn't going to give you any technical measurement, but it's going to give you a general idea if the patient's cool, normal or if they're actually hot. So in temperature, a temperature greater than 100.4 is considered a fever in an adult. Under three months, a rectal temperature greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit is considered a temperature. Three months to three years of age, a rectal temperature greater than 102 degrees Fahrenheit is considered a fever. But at age three months to six months, if a patient or a baby has a fever, is fussy, has decreased, decreased alertness, you wanna make sure that you notify the physician at that time. Or if you're concerned, no matter what the temperature says, then that should be brought up to the physician also. And then three years and older, a temperature of greater than 103 degrees Fahrenheit is considered a fever. Now, I've been talking about Fahrenheit, but what about Celsius? To convert a Fahrenheit degrees to Celsius, we can use this formula, degrees Fahrenheit minus 32, dividing that total by 1.8 will give you your degree in Celsius. 
Now, but what about going backwards from Celsius back to Fahrenheit? Well, we can use these, this equation, taking the degrees in Celsius times 1.8 and taking that total, adding 32, will give us your degree in Fahrenheit. But what about normal temperatures? Normal temperatures in the adult orally are going to be between 97 degrees Fahrenheit to 99 degrees Fahrenheit. Rectally in the adult, 97.9 degrees Fahrenheit to 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And in babies, about 97.9 degrees Fahrenheit to 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. It's going to be usually about one degree higher rectally. Now you want to insert the thermometer about one half inch to one inch in infants and children. And in adults, insert the thermometer about 1.5 inches. A normal axillary temperature is usually between 96.6 degrees Fahrenheit to 98 degrees Fahrenheit. An axillary is usually one half to one degree lower. Tepanically, 95.7 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit is a normal tepanically, and usually this is about one half to one degree higher. And temporally, 97.4 degrees Fahrenheit to 100.1 degrees Fahrenheit is normal, and this is usually about one half to one degree lower. Now, infrared or skin or touches, kind of the new screening temperature we've been using, 98.1 degree Fahrenheit to 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit is the normal. And then hypothermia usually is about less than 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius. Now we're going to talk about pulse rate or heart rate. You can measure the pulse of a person in a variety of different areas. One could be our radial pulse, which is in our wrist. We can measure the carotid pulse. We can measure the apical pulse in the heart using a stethoscope. We can measure it through the femoral artery, the femoral pulse. We can use our foot to measure the dorsalis pedis or the posterior tibialis pulse. Behind our knee, we also have our popliteal pulse. Now I forgot to mention, the numbers I'm giving you are generalities. The data for the normals is going to vary from institution, college, textbook, and just literature in general. Just keep that in mind. Now pulse rate is measured in beats per minute. And normally, less than one years of age should be 100 to 160 beats per minute. For the one to 10 year old, the pulse rate should be between 70 and 120 beats per minute. For the adults, usually between 60 to 100 beats per minute. Now, adults, teenagers can have pulse, rate, pulse rates between 40 and 60 if they are well conditioned, such as in an athlete. Now, as you'll learn, a pulse rate less than 60 is usually going to be defined as bradycardic. A pulse rate greater than 100 is usually going to be defined as tachycardic. And pulse rates can be measured and defined as either being regular, irregular, regularly irregular, and irregularly irregular. <laughs> kind of funny. <laughs> and pulse rates can also be described as faint, weak, normal, or bounding. And usually we kind of use a numbering system for this. They can be measured as zero, meaning absent, one plus being weak, 2 plus being normal, and 3 plus being bounding. Now normally we count a pulse rate for one minute, but you can count a pulse rate for 30 seconds and multiply it times two. But if the patient has a cardiac history or is on medications that may change their pulse rate, you probably want to do it for a minute. So next we're going to talk about respiratory rate. Now a respiratory cycle is one inspiration, that's a deep breath, in and an expiration, which is a breath out. That con constitutes one respiration. One inspiration, one expiration equals one respiration. And for adults, generally it should be between 12 and 20 breaths per minute, which is kind of confusing because it's also measured in BPM, but it's breaths per minute. Ages five, ages five to 12 years, generally should be between 16 to 22 breaths per minute. 
Kids or children usually are between 20 and 30 breaths per minute. Children one to four years of age are usually between 20 and 40 breaths per minute. Infants are usually between 35 and 40 breaths per minute. And newborns generally between 30 and 60 breaths per minute. Now while measuring respiratory rate, that's the one you kind of want to do while you're checking a person's pulse. While you have your hand on their radial artery, preferably, not so much their carotid artery, but after you've counted for the 30 seconds or for the one minute, you want to either put your hand on their shoulder or towards on their back, or just kind of watch the rise and fall of their chest to see what their respiratory rate is. If you told somebody, I'm going to check your respiratory rate, not that they would do it on purpose, but you're going to bring their attention to their breathing. And so now they're going to be focused on whether they're going to slow it down or speed it up, or whatever they're going to do. And ideally you also want to count for one minute. If they are breathing normally and they have no idea that you're watching them, then maybe 30 seconds and multiplying that times two will do. Now respirations can be defined as shallow, which is real small breaths or even labored real deep and kind of maybe a struggling breath. It can be defined primarily as tachypnic is the word that we see most, which is fast breathing. You hardly ever see bradyhypnic. That's a word. Now for blood pressure, you want to make sure that somebody is seated and they're relaxed unless they're of course in a hospital laying in a bed, but with their feet flat on the floor, make sure that they're relaxed. You want to find the right size cuff. If you put a small cuff on a big arm, you're going to get a high blood pressure. If you put a big cuff on a small arm, you're going to get a low blood pressure. Now you want to put the blood pressure cuff about two inches above the fold of the arm, which is about the elbow area or what we would like to call the antecubital fossa. That's where we kind of draw our labs from most of the time. What we're listening for, once we put the blood pressure cuff on the arm, we're going to inflate it. And I'll show you this in the, the clinical skills videos. We're going to inflate the cuff. We're going to put the stethoscope onto the brachial artery, and we're going to listen for a carotid cough sound. That's the thumping we hear in the stethoscopes while the blood pressure cuff is being deflated. Now I mentioned the carotid cough sound. This is the pounding we hear in our stethoscope in our ears while we're listening to a blood pressure. This that was actually discovered in 1905 by a Russian physician named Nikolai Karotikov, hence the name the Karotikov sound. Now for blood pressure, generally we want for adults to be less than 120 over 80 and blood pressure is measured in millimeters of mercury. You'll see it abbreviated MM, little m, little m, and then a capital H and then a G. So millimeters of mercury. If you took chemistry, you've seen that I'm sure. For newborns, blood pressure should be under 65 over 45. That sounds really weird in the adult world. Uh, for ages one to four, 90 over 55. And ages five to 12 years of age, 100 over 60 or under. Now next up is pain. Pain cannot be really measured from our perspective. It is subjective. It is what the patient says. Now pain can be described as sharp, dull, burning, achy, very many different words that a person can describe pain as. And usually it's asked, does it radiate you? And maybe else also what causes it? What causes it to get better? What causes it to get worse? Pain is measured in various ways. Most commonly, it's the 1 to 10 scale. That's the numeric scale. It can also be the Wong Baker faces scale. That's the one where you see where the, that shows like the happy face all the way to the mad face. That's kind of indicating pain levels getting worse. Besides the numeric and the Wong Baker faces scale, there is a variety of other ones. And I really haven't ever used maybe not even half of these. There is the flax scale, the cry scale, the comfort scale, the McGill scale, the color analog scale, the Mankowski scale, the brief pain inventory scale, the descriptor differential scale of pain intensity. There is so many out there, but the most commonly ones that are used that I see are the numeric, the one to 10 and the Wong Baker faces scale. 
And last but not least, I'm gonna talk about is oxygen saturation or SpO2. It is measured by a percent. And normally, depending on what book you read, oxygen saturation of 95% or greater is a normal oxygen saturation. SpO2 is measured in percent. It's actually measuring against the FiO2 of the oxygen that we're breathing. For example, oxygen in the atmosphere or room air as they call it is measured at 21 percent and it starts off at one liter measuring at 24 percent and it increases four percent for every liter if that makes sense so if somebody is is using one liter of oxygen they're using 24 percent fio2 two liters they're using 28% FiO2 and on and on and on. So with that, I like to take it straight to the NCLEX question that I talked about. This is for those of you who are in nursing school and I'm trying to get you prepared for the type of questions that you may see on the NCLEX exam. This is gonna be pertaining to respirations. So here's the question. You are caring for a four week old infant and during your assessment, which findings would require immediate intervention by the nurse? A, abdominal respirations. B, irregular breathing rate. C, inspiratory grunt. D, increased heart rate with crying. E, nasal flaring. F, cyanosis. G, asymmetric chest movement. Or H, presence of the moral reflex or startle reflex. So here's the kicker. Select all that apply. So I'll be posting the answer in the next video along with a new question. So this gives you time to research the question, research the answers, which like I said earlier, is going to make you a better, smarter nurse, not just to pass the NCLEX, but also to save a life. So with that, I'd like to thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel and click on the notification bell so you can be made aware of when I make more new videos. So thank you for watching. God bless and bye-bye.